All right. So welcome to this recorded lecture, which for you know the majority of you will just be like any of every other lecture. Uh, not not running a webcam today, but today we're going to talk about electrons in atoms, in the periodic table. All right. So chapter nine. Blimps, balloons, and models of the atom. So on May sixth, nineteen thirty-seven, the Hindenburg burst into flames and tragically killed 36 of 97 passengers. But what happened? And what is it that makes hydrogen so reactive and flammable? And do we still make blimps out of hydrogen? So modern blimps are not filled with hydrogen. They're actually filled with helium. Um, but what makes helium different than hydrogen, right? If you look at the periodic table, it's very, very close. You know, not too far away. Well, if you think about the atomic number, at least, right? So hydrogen is one and helium is two. So you might think, why is there uh, such a difference in the way that these two elements react? So in this chapter, we're going to learn about that. We're going to learn about the models that explain the inertness of helium and the reactivity of other elements, including hydrogen. And we do have other elements that are as reactive or in some cases, and under some conditions, more reactive than hydrogen, right? So we have um, other group one elements, such as lithium and sodium, right? They don't exist in their elemental form. You can have hydrogen in its elemental form, right? Hydrogen gas. I mean, obviously, they made the Hindenburg or filled the Hindenburg with it. But lithium and sodium cannot exist in their uh, elemental form unless they're protected from oxygen. But then we also look at the inertness of helium, and we see that down going down the periodic table, right, going below helium, in neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, all the way down, those are all the uh, noble gases, and we know that they don't react with anything. So we use models and theories to help explain the observed behaviors of groups, groups of elements. Right, remember we talked about scientific theories? Theories explain why things happen, whereas scientific laws explain what happens. So we're going to look at two models today. Uh, we're going to look at the Bohr model and the quantum mechanical model. And they both propose explanations for the inertness of helium and the reactivity of hydrogen and the periodic law. Right? So the periodic law is when we take the periodic table, or we take all of the elements, and we sort them in order of increasing atomic number. And um, we really kind of take this for granted, but it's pretty amazing that these trends occur. And there's reasons for that. So these models help explain how electrons exist in atoms and how those electrons affect the chemical and physical properties of elements. <clears throat> these are some of the famous quotes. Anyone who is not shocked by quantum mechanics has not understood it. It is kind of wild. Um, that was said by Niels Bohr. <laughs> Schrodinger's quote is, I don't like it. And I am sorry I ever had anything to do with it. <laughs> Schrodinger is famously known for Schrodinger's cat, which was a thought experiment, not an actual experiment carried out. And then Albert Einstein's quote is, God does not play dice with the universe. So the quantum mechanical model of the atom is the foundation of modern chemistry, right? It forms the basis for the modern periodic table. It guides our understanding of chemical bonding and you know, we've seen applications of this, and we use applications of this every day, uh, including semiconductor design. If you don't know what semiconductors are, um, well, they they are what makes up your um, your computer chips, right? A computer chip is made of semiconductors. Silicon is a semiconductor. Um, so much of what we use today has these semiconductor devices in it, and those are only possible because of this quantum mechanical uh, model and how it helps us to understand the way semiconductors will behave. And it also informs the design of new drugs and how those drugs interact with the body to get desired effects or which drugs will not have desired effects. <clears throat> so light, light is electromagnetic radiation. So the interaction of light with atoms helped to shape scientists' models of the atom. And light is a form of electromagnetic radiation, as I just said. Uh, light is not matter. It's something else. It's energy. Light is a type of energy that travels through space and at a constant speed of 3 
times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Light has the properties of both waves and particles. And we see this, you know, when you disturb the surface of, of water, waves are created that radiate outward from the site. The waves carry energy as they move through the water. And light is similar to this. And we describe it in this way. So we have a wavelength, which is the distance between adjacent wave crests, right? Just to highlight this here, that is one wavelength. And so the distance in there, we use uh, the symbol lambda, Greek symbol lambda. Um, and for visible light, the wavelength, the spacing between those peaks and troughs, or sorry, the spacing between peaks in light is what determines color. So white light is actually a spectrum of wavelengths and colors. And we can use a prism actually to separate those out. Um, I don't think in this class we're gonna get into that, but if you take a physics class, they'll explain how light can be separated into its component colors and its component wavelengths by a prism. A red shirt appears red because it is reflecting red light. The shirt absorbs all other colors of light except the red light. So it's the red light that's actually coming in and bouncing off. Oh, you know what? The red light that comes in and bounces off, and that is what, let me draw a crude eyeball here, right? And so that's what's coming into our eyes to be seen. The other spectrum, other colors of light, like blue, they're being absorbed. They don't reflect off or green, right? So those aren't reflecting off. It's the red light that reflects off. So plants, for example, you would do yellow light. Might as well work in as many colors as possible. So when we are looking at plants, plants are actually reflecting green light at us. And they reflect green light because it's one of these smaller, smaller portions of light that comes from the sun. It's not as useful. So the frequency then, we've talked about wavelength, right? Wavelength is um, the distance between uh, peaks, right? That's our wavelength. How frequently, so it's if we had like uh, a point here, and if we were uh, to measure each of these peaks as they pass, the frequency is the number number of peaks per second that pass a certain point. So the wavelength and the frequency are inversely related. So you can see if we had, um, I'll zoom here, and we'll go, all right, let's make a new point, right? So we're coming to here. If we have really tight wavelength, right, really small wavelength, as wavelength goes down, our frequency, what was the symbol for frequency? V, or rho, I think it's rho. Our frequency goes up, right? But if we have more space between these wavelengths, as I just, just so ex excellently drawn, you're gonna see that these are moving constantly at the same speed, but the number of peaks that pass a certain point per second changes. So those are inversely relation or have an inverse relationship or are inversely related. <clears throat> so light can be viewed, right? We talked, uh, I mentioned very briefly that light has the properties of wave and the properties of particles, some properties of each. So a photon is what we call a particle of light or a single packet of light energy. The amount of energy carried in the packet depends on the wavelength of the light. So if we have shorter wavelength, we have more of those peak passing per second, that's higher energy. You can think about it too as, like, as waves in the ocean, right? If, if the beach is getting hit by more waves, or if you're standing in the ocean and you get hit by more waves more frequently, that's higher energy than if you only get hit by a wave every once in a while. So here's a chart of the electromagnetic spectrum. Again, right, we have an inverse relationship between um, 
wavelength and frequency. So you see we have long wavelength and low frequency and low energy, right? As the wavelength gets shorter, use the same colors here, shorter wavelength gives us a higher frequency and a higher energy. So we can look here, right? We have radio waves. Let's highlight these as I go past them, right? Wait, radio waves. Radio waves are very low energy, right? So we're looking um, on the bottom here. This is our wavelength. In net, oh, sorry, sorry. This is these are um, that's for just the visible light spectrum, right? So the, the visible light spectrum is actually this teeny tiny little space in here, right? I just make an H when I'm trying to show the the width of it. It's very small. From 750 nanometers down here at the bottom left to the bottom right of 400 nanometers. Um, but we have the wavelength up here 10 to the 5 meters. Meters. Right? So that's, that's 10,000. Wait, 1, 2, 3, 4. Sorry. That is 100,000 meters is the wavelength crazy long wavelengths all the way down here radio waves are, are occur a little not not quite so crazy long but they're in here right so they're long wavelengths again long wavelength whoops didn't mean to erase that long wavelength low frequency low energy short wavelength high frequency high energy so if we move over to the right side of the spectrum we get things like x-rays and gamma rays and ultraviolet radiation. And this is stuff that you've probably heard about, right? So ultraviolet radiation, UV, is actually just past the visible spectrum of light as we go towards shorter wavelengths. Uh, but that's what gives you a sunburn. And then if you've ever been to the dentist especially or broken a bone, you might have gotten x-rays, right? And so we can do, you can use x-rays to see bones because bones are dense enough to block x-rays and gamma rays if you watch the documentary on uh, Chernobyl or if you've heard of Chernobyl uh, documentary was very good very dark but very good the gamma rays are what's released by um, nuclear reactions right so if we have a nuclear reaction it releases gamma rays and those are highly damaging to uh, tissues we'll talk about these more though so shortest wavelength and the most energetic, those are gamma rays, right? That's all the way at that end of the spectrum. We also have X-rays. Um, X-rays pass through many solid substances. Um, both of these types of radiation... Uh, hold on. Both have medical uses for destroying tumors and uh, imaging, and are energetic enough to damage biological uh, molecules. Um, sorry. So, right, so both have an, are energetic enough to damage biological molecules. So sorry about that. The test is today, and I'm trying to record this lecture. So we have X-ray or gamma beams, and we aim them at tumors. So what we do when we aim these at a tumor is we don't want to damage the healthy tissue that is uh, around the tumor. So <clears throat> the molecules within the tumor cells that carry genetic information are damaged, and the cell stops, dies or stops dividing. What we do is these are all... Each of these individually is a low energy radiation beam. But when they intersect together, right? So we've got three beams all coming into the same spot. That gives us three times the energy, but only in this focused area. So we will get, there will be some damage to healthy cells surrounding the tumor, but very, very minimal and much, much less damage than uh, this malignant tumor would do. 
So then we also, you know, moving back along the spectrum, right? So we started on the, oh, I guess you can't see my hand. We started on the right side. We started with the high energy, and now we're moving towards lower and lower energy, right? So we're at the ultraviolet, which happens right before, um, right outside of visible light. And this is the component of sunlight that produces a sunburn or a tan. It's less energetic than x-rays, but it still is damaging to biological molecules just on the surface, right? So you don't sustain damage beneath your skin, only on the surface of your skin, unless you stay out in the sun long enough, right? And we have uh, visible light, which does not damage <clears throat> biological molecules. It causes the molecules in our eyes to rearrange, which results in vision, which is kind of, it's just crazy. Like you can look into this stuff. There are specific molecules in our eyes and receptors in our eyes for each, well, there's, there's three cones and each response to a certain frequency of light. And it's the combination of those three that give us all the colors. Um, there is a, also a rare, um, you can call it a mutation. It's called tetrachromia, right? So when we talk about our, uh, Prefixes for naming nonmetal compounds. Tetra means four. So some people have three cone or four cones, excuse me, four cones in their eyes. And they can see more colors than other people. They often don't know it because it doesn't cause any problems. But uh, almost exclusively in women, too. Um, all right. Infrared light is actually the heat that you feel when you place your hand near an object. Uh, a hot object. You're feeling the infrared light. Well, actually, what you're feeling is the infrared infrared light hitting your hand and causing your hand to warm up because your hand is absorbing the infrared light. Um, all warm objects emit infrared light. It's called black body radiation. Uh, and infrared sensors are often used in night vision technology to see in the dark. And basically what those infrared sensors are doing Right, you can get a get infrared camera. It's taking those infrared signals and it's translating them into something that we can see, often through the screen. So, right, so we can use infrared, um, sorry, you can use infrared uh, photography, right? So the photograph, the warmest areas appear as red and the coolest areas appear as blue. Uh, microwaves, right? So now we're past uh, visible light and we're on the other side now to longer um, frequencies. Microwaves are used for radar and in microwave ovens. So microwaves have been specifically tuned for uh, water, actually. So those frequencies that are being emitted, the electromagnetic frequencies by your microwave, are targeted at water. And the water then gets excited by absorbing that energy and heats uh, substances that it's inside of, right? That's why you should never run your microwave when it's open because there's a lot of water in humans. And then radio waves are even longer frequencies than microwaves, right? So this is why when people talk about, oh, 5G radiation, it's going to kill us all. It's going to give us all cancer. It's not the case. Um, right? It's not the case because that the energy from those radio waves is still much, much longer, right? It's not even visible. So it's before the visible, it's before microwave, I believe. I have to confirm that. But radio waves like your AM, FM radio in your car, your, um, uh, your phone uses radio waves to communicate. Excuse me. Yeah, so your phone uses radio waves to communicate, your Wi-Fi is using radio waves to communicate. Um, and actually the gigahertz, right? 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. That's the frequency. Okay. So, uh, not the specific frequency, but let's, let's go then and uh, let's arrange these colors of visible light in order of increasing uh, wavelength, right? So <clears throat> we're in going in order of increasing wavelength. So we want to have the um, shortest wavelength first. And a short wavelength means high frequency, means low energy, or high energy, excuse me. High frequency, high energy, right? So wavelength, our shortest wavelength is going to be blue. And then green. And then red. 
Because red light, you remember infrared, infrared light, longer frequency than visible light, is just below, um, or sorry, just longer than red light. That's why it's called infrared, below red. Um, then for frequency, right, we're going to sort these in the opposite. So the highest frequency is going to be blue, right? Because the shortest wavelength has the highest frequency. So we're going to put red first, because we're going in increasing order, and then green again, and then blue. I can spell blue. <laughs> red, green, then blue. So then we look energy per photon, and remember, long wavelength, low frequency, low energy. Short wavelength, high frequency, high energy. So our order of energy per photon is going to be the same as our um, frequency, right? Because we're going in order of increasing frequency. So the Bohr model is one of the first models that we have that really explains something about how atoms work and how electrons in atoms work. So the neon atoms inside of a glass tube, those neon atoms are absorbing electrical energy and then they re-emit that energy as light. And we can get different colors if we use different elements. So mercury lamps are blue and hydrogen lamps are pink. But like why, why these colors, you know? It's specific to these elements. <clears throat> so you can, if you have the right instrumentation, you'll see that the light emitted by a hydrogen atom or, you know, hydrogen in one of these tubes where they're being excited by electricity contains distinct wavelengths that are specific to hydrogen. It's kind of hard to see here, so I'm going to zoom in. All right, so we've got sort of a yellowish band. Use orange because it's easier to see, right? There's an orangish red band there. Um, there's like a blue band here. It's maybe a little more purple than that blue is. Let's see if we can get a more. This is probably it. Yeah, that looks good. And then we've got purple, more of a purple down here. And then there's even one more band all the way at the very bottom that's, on this, looks almost black, right? So we get this very unique signature for hydrogen. And why might, might, why might that be the case? Why doesn't it just emit at all, all frequencies of light? So we look at a white light spectrum right, something like from the sun or from one of our lamps or even the, you know, phone on your phone, the flash on your phone, the spectrum is pretty much continuous with some radiation emitted at every wavelength. The emission spectrum of an individual element includes only specific wavelengths. So you can see here we have our, our hydrogen light spectrum and our helium light spectrum and our neon light spectrum. Neon's got just a whole host of different bands, but they are distinct bands. The Bohr model sought to explain this. So why do atoms, excited atoms, only emit light at particular wavelengths? So he came up with this model where we've got our nucleus, and then we have these different distinct energy levels as we get farther from the nucleus, and they're called orbits. So the electron could be hanging out on one of these orbits, and the higher we go up and away from the uh, nucleus, the higher energy it is, right? It's harder to stay out there. It's harder to have, keep that distance. You can kind of think of it um, like, like a, well, what's a better example? Like a satellite, right, orbiting the Earth. It takes an incredible amount of energy to get that far away from the Earth. You know, it takes a lot of energy just to get from, let's call this, if we call this the surface, right? Well, you fill this in, right? So this is the Earth. Right, imagine that this is the Earth in here. N equals 1 is the surface of the Earth. This is like flying on an airplane. This is maybe a low Earth orbit satellite. And as you get farther and farther away, it takes more and more energy to get out there. And this is called quantization. So Bohr theorized that, or hypothesized, that each orbit is fixed or quantized. And then that these orbits could be specified by a quantum number, right? So these, these correlate to our picture from before. There are only these steps on the ladder, and you can only stand on those steps. 
So he theorized that it was impossible for an electron to exist in this space between. So it's not like walking up a hill, right? You can walk up a hill and you can stand at any point as you move up that hill. But um, but if you're on a ladder, right, you can only move up and down one rung. So Bohr's model was kind of like uh, a weird looking ladder, right? So we've got these very unevenly spaced steps on the ladder. Uh, I got a request for a question. Pause for one second. I'm gonna keep talking here so that you realize, don't, don't think that um, there's something wrong with the video. Um, let's see here. So when a hydrogen atom absorbs energy, an electron is excited to higher energy orbit. The electron then relaxes back to a lower energy orbit, emitting a photon of light, right? So it's just like if you threw, um, right, standing on the ground, like in our previous sort of example, if you're standing on the ground, um, Apologize for that sound. If you're standing on the ground, right, things stay on the ground. If you throw something in the air, it's going to come back down. So imagine that you're climbing a ladder and you're really, really tired. So as you go up the ladder, it's hard to stay on top of that ladder. And you're going to fall back down to earth because you don't want to be that high on the ladder. You're too tired. You want to come back down. Um, so there's no, right, we can't. Energy is not created or destroyed. It always has to go somewhere. So when we excite this electron up to a higher energy level, up to a higher energy level, when it comes back down to a lower energy level, right, so this is energy coming in, then some of that energy is going to be released back out. And so what we're seeing when we have these specific energy or light bands from specific elements those are the different electrons going to different um, sort of these quantized steps on the ladder and then coming back down and they release that extra energy as light. So the light emitted by excited atoms consists of specific lines at specific lit wavelengths and each of those corresponds to a specific transition between two orbits. All right, so red is going from three, I'll use red, Right, going from 3 down to 2, whereas blue-green, I think I have a blue-green color here, maybe? I have a blue. Use blue, right? So blue is then coming from 4 down to 2, and violet, this is more of a magenta, is coming from 5 down to 2. So the higher that we're coming down from, right? So if we're coming from 5 down to 2, we're releasing more energy. And if you remember, right, so... This is our wavelength in nanometers right here. All right, so 657 is a longer wavelength. Long wavelength means a low frequency and low energy. But on the right side, we have a short, whoops, a short wavelength, so we have a high frequency and high energy, or at the very least higher energy, right, when comparing them. So this bigger jump means higher energy, a lower jump means lower energy. So the greatest success of Bohr's model is that it actually predicted the lines of the hydrogen emission spectrum. It failed though, in predicting the emission spectra of other elements that contained more than one electron. So the Bohr model was then replaced with a more sophisticated model called the quantum mechanical model. And I just want to highlight here too that, you know, just because Bohr's model didn't work doesn't mean it wasn't pivotal in creating new knowledge, right? This is the process that, that science takes, right? You come up with a theory, or you come up with a hypothesis like Bohr did, and it did successfully predict hydrogen, but there were some pieces that were missing, right? So then it goes back to the drawing board, 
you come up with some other explanations, you do some more research, and we expand on that. And so the Bohr model gets expanded then into the quantum mechanical model. So our quantum mechanical model of the atom replaced the Bohr model. This happened actually in the early 20th century, right? So 1900s. It was revolutionary because the electrons do not behave like particles flying through space. Bohr's orbits were replaced with quantum mechanical orbitals. So not orbits, right? So we have orbits. That's like the, the moon travels around the Earth. All right, so we got the, if this is a, you know, absolutely 100% to scale, we have, um, there's the Earth, and we have the moon. The Earth travels, or the moon travels around the Earth in an orbit. But orbitals are different. Orbitals represent probability maths that show a statistical distribution of where the electron is likely to be found. Or, to sort of translate, translate that a little bit, orbitals are the area. So instead of having Earth and a set line around it where, where we can track the moon, right? We always know where the moon is. It's more of a cloud. And basically what we're saying is that the electron is in here somewhere. Well, actually, what we're saying is it's in here probably. So it's just saying that there's a 90% chance that it's in this space somewhere. Because it's not a particle, and it doesn't move like a particle. Um, it has some pro particle-like properties, but it is not a particle. So these orbitals, then, are this space, this volume where we are likely to find the electron. So you can kind of compare baseballs versus electrons, right? So a baseball's path can easily be traced as it travels from the pitcher to the catcher. But if we threw an electron in this way, it would land in a different place every time. So electrons and photons exhibit wave particle duality, right? So if we pitched our electron here, we'd have to construct a probability map of where it would cross the home plate, right? So it would be, I don't know, maybe the best pitcher or the worst pitcher, depending on what these areas are. So you can see that in the center, 20% of our electrons are going to land right there, dead center, right? Easy for the batter to hit. 40% of them are going to land just outside of that. Um, oh, oh, and then then forty percent. So this is not, this isn't. Um, this twenty percent is not that twenty percent are in there. Um, well, twenty percent are in there. This forty percent then. There's a lot of colors going on here, so it's hard to hard to draw. But this forty percent includes that twenty percent, right? So there's another twenty percent outside of that. And then there's another 30% when we look at this 70. So in this big area, there's a 70% chance we're going to get electron in there. There's still a 30% chance it'll be somewhere else. Um, but this is how our probability kind of works. All right, so orbit is a circular path showing the electron's motion around the nucleus, right? Like I said, if we have... Uh, oh, we should use blue for Earth, huh? If we have our blue Earth... And then we have the gray moon. And then it's tracing this path. Right? That's an orbit. Orbitals, on the other hand. So let's use uh, red. Right? So we've got... Let's make a little nucleus here. Right? So that's helium, basically. The orbit... Orbital. Al. Orbital is just a nebulous area around it. Completely unpredictable where the electron is going to be. Sorry, I'll leave that, I'll give you a second longer. It's a recording, so you can pause, but. If we then, okay, so our orbitals then, right? So we now know the quantum mechanical model is a better model of what the electron or atom is actually like. The number of the orbital is called our principal quantum number, n. And it specifies the principal shell of the orbital. So n equals n can equal one, two, three. They're always whole numbers. It's not gonna, you're not going to have orbital 
one and a half, right? So it's always one, two, three, four. They're integers. Um, the letter indicates then, so we have this other number or this other way that we describe these um, orbitals, and we use a letter to indicate the subshell, and that specifies the shape of the orbital. So our possible letters there are S, P, D, and F. The one S orbital is the lowest energy orbital. Orbitals are three-dimensional. And um, we can use a dot representation like this. It's kind of hard to see. You can't really see the 3D nature of this, but you can use a dot representation. Um, and the way this works, essentially, is that imagine you're taking a photograph of an electron every 10 seconds for 10 minutes, right? So every time you take a picture, you put a dot down for where that's at. Take a picture, put a dot. Take a picture, put a dot. Take a picture, put a dot, right? So you're doing that, and you're mapping it over time. And the dot density represents the probability of finding an electron there. So if I zoom in on this, it's a little bit hard to see. But if you look into the center here, and you can compare that with maybe here, and then all the way out here at the edge of our orbital, look at how much the density changes when you move from one area to the next. Right at the edges here, we're very, very spaced out. But then through the center, it's almost completely packed, right? So the closer to the nucleus, there's, there's more likely chance that it's going to be in that area. Uh, I'm going to post a link to a video that I thought was really good at explaining this. Um, if you want to just Google it, uh, you can look for Minute Physics. Minute Physics. A better way to picture atoms. Actually, I'll, what I'll do too is I'll put uh, a link to that video in the description of this one once I get it uploaded. Um, and that does, it's a really, really cool video uh, and really shows you how those atoms work. So make sure you check that out. Or not, not how atoms work, but what these orbitals look like in three-dimensional space. <clears throat> so we can also represent um, orbitals as a geometric shape. So again, kind of hard to see here, and I'll zoom in in a second. Our S orbital, right? So we have um, S, P, D, and F. Those will be important, right? We're going we're gonna to figure out how to use those later. But our S orbitals are spheres. So we've got a spherical S orbital. And the sphere represents the volume in which the electron is found 90% of the time. And then the uh, electron is expected to be outside the shape 10% of the time. Right? So electrons are real tricky things and hard to nail down. So you can kind of see the edge right here. Right? There's that filled in blue area. And so inside of that shell is where we'll have a 90% chance of finding the electron somewhere inside. <clears throat> so the single electron of an undisturbed hydrogen atom at room temperature is in the 1s orbital. This is called the ground state, or the lowest energy state. Electrons generally seek out the lowest energy orbital available. They're lazy, right? They want to they stay in the lowest energy state, um, kind of like cats, right? Cats always find the lowest energy state uh, until they don't, and then they're crazy, you know, the sprinting around, jumping off stuff, knocking things over. Uh, there's a joke that I like that fits in here. Uh, what's the lowest energy state of a cow? Ground beef. Hopefully I got a few groans on that one, because it's truly the... It's truly the goal with a joke like that. So the absorption of energy can cause the electron to jump to a higher energy orbital. This is an excited state, which is unstable. Uh, and all atoms have one ground state and then many excited states, right? So it's like giving, the, uh, giving a monster or a shot of espresso to the electron. It puts it in that excited state, but it's a little bit unstable. Well, it's unstable. It's just, it is unstable. <laughs> so in the N1 principal shell, we have one subshell, S, right, or S orbital. 
in the N2 principal shell, and remember, N is our um, principal quantum number. Let me write that down. N equals principal quantum whoops, number. And then S, P, D, F, each of these is a uh, subshell. So in our N2, N equals 2 principal shell, we have two subshells, S and P. Um, and the 2S orbital is higher in energy and slightly larger than the 1S orbital, right? You see that this one's a little smaller than this one. And it's higher energy, right? As we move farther away from the nucleus, we have higher energy. The 2p subshell has three orbitals in it. And they each have the same sort of dumbbell shape and the same energy. They have different orientations, however, and they do not overlap. So this is a key thing to know. You see this gap? Right, so there's a gap there. Oh, you can't see it here because it's in a different angle, right? This is sort of going into the screen. You can see it on this one a little bit, right? So there's a gap there. Now, the electron, the electron can jump from this side to this side without crossing any points in between. Just kind of, you know, let your mind be baffled by that. These are our 2B, this is our 2P subshell though, right? We've got these three dumbbell shapes. They're taking place in the X, oops, on our X axis, Y axis, and Z axis. And so those correspond X, Y, Z. Canvas message real quick. Okay. I will answer that when I finish this. All right, we're about halfway through. Making very good time. A lot of this chapter is conceptual. So the number of subshells in a given principal shell is equal to n. Right, so at uh, n equals four, we have four subshells. We have all four of them, s, p, d, and f. At three, we only have s, p, and d. Two is s and p. And in n equals one, we just have the one subshell. The n equals three principal shell contains three subshells, right, like we just saw. And um, those are S, P, and D. The S and P subshells contain the 3S and the 3P orbitals, similar in shape to the 2S and 2P orbitals, but again, slightly larger and higher in energy, right? So every time we move, you may have noticed a trend now, right? So if we have N equals one, we only have one, that's one S orbital. If we have N equals two, we have the 1s orbital, but we've also now added the 2s and the 2p, right? Because we have s and p orbitals. n equals 2, two subshells, those are s and p. At n equals 3, right, so our third principal quantum number, we now not only have 1s, 2s, we also have 2p, but now we have added 3s, 3p, and 3d, right? So now we have s, p, and d. And that continues on for 4 as well. But so when we look at these and we see that we have 3s and 3p orbitals, similar in shape, right? 3s, 3p. They're similar in shape but larger than the 2s and 2p orbitals, right? These are 3s because they're in the n equals 3 principal shell. And the D subshell contains five D orbitals. We'll see those in a second. These are, whoops, went back two pages that time. These are our three D orbitals and they have this X shape. Most of them do. So we have um, four of them in this sort of X configuration. And let me zoom in on this guy. You'll see that this is D Y Z. And if you look at this orbital, it is in the y-axis and the z-axis, right? So that's d, y, z, d for the d orbital. And if we have this one, d, x, y, 
You can look that it's in the X and the Y planes, but not in the Z plane. So that carries on for all of them. And then we get to the fifth orbital, which is this crazy little number. We have the dumbbell, which looks like a P orbital, but also includes a donut. Um, this one's probably my favorite because it is the weirdest. Um, and so this is called Z squared, and it's really just in the Z orbital, or Z plane. Um, and again, the electron can jump from one point in the donut to one point in the dumbbell to the other side of the dumbbell without ever crossing the space in between. So an electron configuration shows the occupation of orbitals by electrons for a particular atom. Right? So I just hinted at this a little bit. For a ground state hydrogen atom, we have uh, this, this is the notation. So there's one orbital, we're in the first orbital, we're in the S subshell, right? One only has the first uh, n number, n equals one only has one subshell, and we only have one electron. So we have one electron in the 1s orbital. All right, this one electron we know from this one here. And we have the 1s orbital because this one here. And the s, I suppose, right? So an orbital diagram gives similar information but shows the electrons as arrows in a box representing the orbital. Okay, so we always draw our electrons uh, like this guy here. So it's like a almost like a one. And this is to indicate the spin, which we'll talk about on this next slide, I think. I think it's the next slide. So the box represents the 1s orbital, right? That's here. And the arrow represents the electron in the 1s orbital. So in our orbital diagrams, the direction of the arrow represents this electron spin, which is just a fundamental property of electrons. And we have this Pauli exclusion principle, big fancy term, that orbitals may hold no more than two electrons with opposing spins. Okay, so if we were to draw, um, right, let's do for hydrogen again. Let's, let's do helium, right? So we have helium. That This is the 1s orbital. And we have one electron, and we write the second electron like this. So we can't have any more than two electrons, and they have to have opposing spins. All right, so don't draw this. This is wrong. This is also wrong. No, not indicating the spin at all, also wrong. So write electron configure. let's write electron configurations orbital diagrams for helium and for lithium. Okay, so we'll pull up the periodic table for this. Uh, we don't need those molecular weights. So let me grab the, <clears throat> the other periodic table. Cool, cool, cool. Let me do this. We can make this guy a little bit bigger. Doesn't really need to be. So then we're gonna do helium. And the way that we do this is that we're gonna look at um, we're going to move left to right across the periodic table, right? And you're going to stay in the same row before moving down to the next row. So for helium, helium, H-E, sorry, <clears throat> we're going to have our electron configuration. It's going to be one, and because uh, we're in the first period, right? First period is one. That corresponds with the uh, orbital. And then we have one, S, right, because our, our first shell, our first subshell is uh, S, and then we're going to say 1S2, because as we're moving from hydrogen has one electron, helium has two electrons. If we were to draw this as the orbital diagram, just make sure, right, these are the orbital, orbital diagrams. Yeah. Okay, so we have our orbital diagram. Again, this is still 1S, but we have two electrons. We have 1, 2 right, with opposite spins. Uh, let's do another color just for fun. Now we're gonna do lithium. Okay, so lithium is atomic number three. So we're gonna start at hydrogen, 
and we're going to count across. We're going to say, delete that little dot. We're at the one, right? So we're in one, and then our first subshell is S. We have hydrogen, which is one electron. Helium, that gives us two electrons, so we're going to do one S2. And then we move down to the next row. So now we're in period two. So we have two, and then our first subshell in uh, principal shell two. I know it's, it can be confusing. We're going to be S again. And we're only in the first group, so that's 2S1. So if we're to draw this then as our orbital diagrams, this will be our 1S, this will be our 2S, and then we fill in our electrons like so. Right, so we have two electrons in our 1s orbital and one electron in our 2s orbital. This will make sense more as we continue on and we start to do more of these. You'll see how they, how they work out. They're very formulaic. There are two exceptions, but the rest of them are form formulaic. And those are only for two elements. Okay, so uh, in our multi-electron atoms, right, so when we start adding more and more electrons, the subshells within a principal shell do not have the same energy because of electron-electron interactions. And this is why Bohr's model fell apart. His model only worked when you didn't have any other electrons interacting with each other. So as these electrons interact with each other, they, the energy levels change, and they get different. So, right, so this is our um, the increasing energy over here. So our 1s is our lowest energy, our 2s is higher energy, and our 2p ends up being a little bit higher than that. 3s is just a little higher, 3p is higher again, 4s goes up, and then we get 3d, and then this gap between 3d and 4s has gotten real small at this point. Uh, and we'll see how that, that comes into play afterwards. So generally, electrons want to fill up the lowest energy orbitals first, right? So you can see how we had 1s, 2s, then 2p, then 3s, then 3p as we go up. But now we've hit 4s before we got to 4d, or 3d, excuse me. So that'll be important here in a second. All right, so let's do, let's do one that's a little bit more complicated than lithium. Let's go to carbon, okay? So... We start with carbon, and we're, again, we're starting at helium, or hydrogen. We're counting from left to right across the periodic table. So we're going to say 1, S, and then we're going to fill those orbitals up, right? Because we're going to go hydrogen to helium, that's two electrons. That fills that up. We're going to go to 2S now, because we're coming down. And so then lithium and beryllium, that's two more electrons. Now we're going to boron and carbon. So now we've got our p orbitals, right? So we're going to do 3p, and then carbon is the second atom in the 3p orbital. So we're going to put 3p2. All right. Now let's do an orbital diagram again. So we can basically look at where carbon is on the periodic table, and we can see that it's in the second row. So we know we're going to have 1s. We can see that it's to the right of groups 1 and 2. So it's going to have 2s. And then for the p orbitals, the p orbitals actually have, there's actually three orbitals. So these are all 3p. Or sorry, sorry, not, not, not 3. 2p, 2p, 2p. But when we fill in electrons, we want to use Hund's rule. When filling in orbitals of equal energy, electrons fill them slight singly first. So with the single electron first, they don't want to group up. They don't want to be bunk buddies. They want their own room. So we're going to go 1s, 2s. Uh, sorry, one, one electron. So we're going to do two electrons in, two, in 1s, two electrons in 2s, and then we have two electrons in 2p because a boron, or because carbon is in the p orbitals. I need, uh, let me, 
me try and get a periodic table that I can draw on here because that's going to be immensely helpful. Hold on, let's let's go back to a periodic table. I thought there was one back here, right? No, 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 no. Oh my gosh. Oh here. I can go faster than this. Let's see. There's a periodic table on here. Okay. So when we're looking at the periodic table directly, this is a great periodic table because it shows us the S block elements and the P block elements. S block, P block, D block, and F block. We won't really get into F block, uh, especially in this class, but what we're really concerned about is the S and the P. So let's do carbon again. And let me actually draw these sort of with their respective energy levels, right? So 1s, we're going to do, uh, let's do it on the side, 1s, 2s, and then, right, each of these is, um, did it again, 2p. So we're going to grab one hydrogen for, or one, or one electron for hydrogen, one electron for helium, then we move to the next period, and we're going to do one electron for lithium. We're going to do one electron for beryllium. And then we move all the way over to the P block. And notice here, too, we have one, two, three, four, five, six columns, six groups in the P block. And that is exactly how many electrons we can have in our two P orbitals. So I'll we'll fill those in here again. So there's one elect. Well, 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 again, Hun's rule, right? We're going to do one electron each first, and we're just going to carbon. So there's one for boron, and one for carbon. And that's Hun's rule that we fill them singly first, right? They don't want to be bunk buddies. Okay. Let me copy this slide, and then we're going to bring back over to here. I'm going to paste that guy in real quick. And then we'll go back over here. We can clear this page. All right, that way you still have it in your notes. The slides are going to be a little out of order now, but not too bad. OK? So that's how we fill up those orbitals. That's, how, that's where I'm getting those electron numbers from. There's that again. So let's say my mom, Mrs. K, has opened up a quantum hotel, a discount resort for electrons in chemistry land. So we can think of these shells, these orbitals, as rooms in a hotel. The first floor just has one room. That's the S room. The second floor has two rooms, the S and P rooms. The third floor has three rooms, S, P, and D. And then each S room has one bed. The P rooms have three beds. D rooms have five beds. And F rooms, they're really more of bunk houses. They have seven beds. And there's only two people per bed, and they have to have opposite spins. So, right, so our floors are equivalent to our principal quantum number, our principal shell, right? That's n equals one, two, three, and so on. Our room is equal to our subshell, so it's S, P, D, F. And then our orbital, our orbital is the number of well, it's our, right, the beds are the orbitals, right? So P, P has three orbitals, or three beds. And then the people are electrons, and the money is energy, right? So you got to have the energy to get into those rooms. Got to have the money to pay for those. <clears throat> so let's do another example here, um, just real quick while we have this up. Let's fill these in, and let's go all the way to neon, okay? So again, we're starting at hydrogen. That's one electron in our 1s, right? So one person moves in there, and then we get another person moved in there. Because neon, you can tell, too, according to its um, atomic number, how many electrons it's going to bring on, right? So we're going to have uh, neon is a group group of 10 people. Right? So we've got to fill these rooms up to get Neon's group situated. Um, so then this will be lithium and beryllium. 
and then we're going to move up to just the very next energy level because they are they're stingy. They don't want to spend too much money on these rooms. And we'll fill these singly first, right? So a single one in each. Uh, boron, carbon, nitrogen, right? Moving right across the periodic table. We got three more, but now that we have one person in each room, or one person in each bed, we can put another person in each bed. And then we'll get oxygen, fluorine, and neon, right? So this would be the orbital diagram for Mr. Neon. <clears throat> you can also use this method for figuring out what order to fill orbitals in, because it does get a little bit tricky when we get up to the d orbitals after 4s. So what happens is you just write a column like this, right? So you write 1s, 2s, 3s. I don't have to do it here because it's already there. And then next to 2s, you'll write 2p. And then from there you go down, 3p, 4p, 5p, 6p, 3d, 4d, 5d, 6d. And what you're going to do then is follow these lines, right? So you're always moving down the diagonal. I was moving, oh, come on, stop. The diagonal. And that tells you which order to fill those orbitals in. All right, so you just follow this as it snakes around. I like to think about it as just slashes across. But if we look at the periodic table too, We can see that, and this is the periodic table that I borrowed from earlier. I'm actually going to make another copy of this page in case we need it later. Um, right, so we have hydrogen, <clears throat> right? So this is our, let's draw it, we can draw it over here, right? So 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, 6s, and we'll go 2p, 3p, 4p, right? Pretty simple. It's not, it's not too hard. You just got to remember where to start and how to do the next rows, um, which that sounded like a rest of the owl post. And then we go 3d, 4d, 5d. We could do 6p. 7s is the last one. <clears throat> so we'll just go that far. So if you wanted to fill these orbitals up, right, you go 1s, whoops, Let's use a thin red, right? 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 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 3p, 
Um, sorry. Uh, problem with quiz. Gosh. All right. So let's write electron configurations and orbital diagrams for nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. All right, write the electron configurations and orbital diagrams for nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. So for nitrogen, again, we're gonna need our periodic table. And uh, let's see here. We're gonna do nitrogen. So nitrogen, right, we're gonna start at, one. you always start with 1s. We're gonna do 1s2. Then we're gonna go to 2s, because that's our next orbital. We're going to do 2s2 because of lithium beryllium as we're counting across. And then we go to 2p. And nitrogen is going to be 2p3. All right, so then our orbital diagrams are going to be, all right, we got our 1s, we got our 2s, and then we have three orbitals for 2p. And then we got a 2p, <clears throat> 1s, 2s, 2p. So again, we can then use our electron configurations to very easily fill these out, right? So you have one, two electrons. That's this number here, right? These are the numbers of electrons in each of these orbitals. And then one, two. And then these ones, right, we fill them up according to Hund's principle. So one each before we fill the rest. Okay, so now if we do oxygen, oxygen again, right? So we're going to do 1s2, 2s2, right? It's right next to ni uh, nitrogen, so basically the same up till that point. And then we're going to go to 2p. We see that oxygen is 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 electrons or 4 columns into 2p. So we're just going to have 4. So again, our diagram here is going to look very much the same. 1s, 2s, 2p, and then 2p has three orbitals. So we're going to have one, two electrons, one, two electrons, and then we'll fill these like this first. And then since we have four electrons to fill in here, we'll add that one in just like that. Now, let me zoom in here so I can do this because I wrote it so small. There we go, right? Whew, did it fit more in here? Good thing I've got the magic iPad. Okay, so let's do fluorine now. And again, you're probably beginning to see a pattern. 1s2, 2s2, 2p. Ah, but where is it in p? Well, it was right after oxygen. So we're gonna have five, right? Because you can count, it's uh, from if you're using the numbers at the top, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 2p5. Then we're going to have our 1s, 2s, and then our 3p orbitals. 
1s, 2s, and then 2p. And again, right, we're just using these numbers from fluorine's uh, electron configuration to fill these in. So fill that one, then this one, then one, two, three, right? Fill up the empty ones first, and then come back and add in electrons with the opposite spin. All right, so we got all five of those electrons in there. So now neon, we're going to do, and neon again, right? It's just after fluorine. So very, very similar. 1s2, 2s2, 2p, and then we count, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. So 2p6. And again, 1, 1s, right? 1s orbital, 2s orbital, 1, 2, 3, and that's 2p. So we got one, two electrons there, and we're filling, right? From the lowest energy to the highest energy orbital that we have, we always start at the bottom. So we'll fill each of these with one first. We have three more to fill, right? Because we need a total of six. So it's four, five, six with the opposite energy. You can see that neon actually has all of its orbitals filled. So this is tedious to write out like this, and you can imagine the farther you go down the periodic table, the more tedious it gets, but we do have a shortcut. So we can use neon. We could say neon, and you'll write it like this, and we can use that as a shortcut for everything after neon on the periodic table. So for example, if we want to do the electron configuration of sodium, right, sodium, we would say neon. All right, we're starting at neon, and then we would just do 3s1. Because the first orbital that comes after neon is the 3s orbital, and one electron because sodium is the first one in the s block. <clears throat> These aren't too hard. There's kind of a lot of things you have to pay attention to, but once you've got those down, it's, it's really pretty easy. The electron configuration of the previous noble gas can be abbreviated by the symbol for the noble gas in brackets. Okay, so we just did sodium, right? So if we wanted to do um, sodium, we would say neon in brackets, and again, the next orbital is 3s1. So the neon is actually just a shorthand for all of the electrons that come before it because they're completely filled up. You can only do this with noble gases, right? You can't just pick another gas, or sorry, pick another element and just say, well, I'm going to start from, you know, if we want to do oxygen, I can't just say uh, nitrogen. And, well, then things get weird, right? Because it's nitrogen, but nitrogen already has three electrons in the p orbital, so it just doesn't work. So you, you can use noble gases to take a shortcut down the periodic table. So let's write the electron or the uh, <clears throat> electron configurations, right? We're just going to do the electron configurations here, not the orbital diagrams. Um, but for aluminum, find aluminum on the periodic table. And we can see that aluminum comes after neon, right? So neon is everything through period two. And then aluminum starts at period three. So we'll say neon. And then, right, because neon is everything through 2, so the next orbital is 3s, and we're going to fill both of those up, and then we're going to do 3p, and we're going to count, oh, aluminum's the first one in the p block, so 3p1. Bromine, so bromine's a little bit different, right? So we're moving down. Bromine is in period 4, so that just means that we start with argon, right? Argon is the last element in period 3. It's the noble gas in period three. And now instead of starting at 3s, we start at 4s. 4s2, right, one and two. And then bromine is the sixth or the fifth element in 3p or 4p, right? So we do 4p next. And we'll do, uh, right, five, of, five electrons in 4p, right? Because you have gallium, germanium, arsenic, selenium, and then bromine. For strontium, 
Now for strontium, we can start at kryptonite. Sorry, not kryptonite, krypton. And then krypton is the last element in period four. So we're gonna be starting with our 5s orbital. And strontium is actually the second element in period five in our S block, so he gets two electrons. And that is that. So if we look then and write an orbital diagram for argon, let's do the full orbital diagram here, okay? Argon. Because we can't, we can take a shortcut, right? These are electron configurations and we can take a shortcut for those. We don't take shortcuts for orbital diagrams. So we're gonna have 1s, right? We always start with 1s and then we go to 2s. Then we go to 2p, oh, sorry, 2p, that was 1, 2, 3. And then we go to 3s, and then 3p, which has three of its own. And, right, electro, or argon, or any element really, in its neutral state, right, if it's not an ion, has the same number of electrons as it does protons. So we need to fill in 18 protons then. So we'll go, or sorry, 18 electrons. One, two, three, four. And again, always practice this. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Every orbital is completely filled. And notice I did follow Hun's rule when filling those up, you know, that's what I was saying, you should practice, just fill them up one at a time first and then come back and get the rest of them. It really reinforces in your brain Hun's rule without having to remember it rotely. Okay, so we talked about valence, valence electrons a little bit early on. Um, and valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost principal shell. So the principal shell with the highest principal quantum number. These electrons are important because they are involved in chemical bonding. They're the reason that atoms stick together in molecules. The electrons are not in the outermost principal shell. They're called core electrons. So if we were to look at argon back here again, our um, valence electrons are just these ones. Right, these are our valence because these are in the highest energy shell. Silicon has four valence electrons in the N equals three principal shell, and it has 10 core electrons, right? So these are everything in the shell below the highest shell. And so there's 10 in here, there's four up here in the valence. Those are the ones on the outer shell. So let's write an electron configuration for chlorine and identify the valence electrons and core electrons. Because we're going to be identifying the valence and core electrons, we're not going to use an abbreviation here. So uh, we'll start again with, it's right out here, we're doing chlorine. We're going to do 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, Right, we can take a shortcut, well, take a shortcut a little bit because we know that chlorine's in the next row. So we already know all of these are gonna be written. Then we can go down to 3s2 because chlorine is in the P block. So we know it's gonna have its S shell filled. And then we do 3p and chlorine is the fifth element in the P block, so five, right? So now where are our valence electrons? Our valence electrons are going to be these, right? These are both in the three, uh, number three principal shell. The rest of these are our core electrons. So again, we have oh, 10 core electrons, and now we have seven valence electrons. Cool. 
So it's easy actually to determine the number of valence electrons, especially in these main group elements, right? Remember that these blocks on the left and right, those are our main group elements. Um, and the elements in the same column all have the same number of valence electrons. And those are actually highlighted here for us. Make it a little easier to spot, right? So we have one, 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 all only one valence electron. And then we also have, I should use the pointer, two for beryllium, two valence electrons for uh, magnesium, right? And you can see that trend follows throughout this entire table. Through these, you know, we took basically the, right, the top three rows of the periodic table and smushed them together. The number of valence electrons for any main group element, except helium, is equal to the group number of its column. And our main group elements are those A columns, right? 1A, 2A, uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, A. And the row number in the periodic table is equal to the number of the highest principal shell in our main group elements. Right, so this is going to be 1S, 2S, 3S. And that holds, and then 4s and 5s, that's going to stay the same. These are going to be, you know, these are, uh, you know, up to 5s, 4s. Over here, we've got 5p and 4p, right? And that continues up here, too, as well. 3p, 2p. Uh, there is no 1p, right? Because in the first, first principal shell, we only have s. This table also shows those individual, for each atom, the valence shell con electron configurations. You want to refer back to this. Oops, screen on my computer went to sleep. So the transition series, <clears throat> these, these ones in the middle, these are our transition elements. The transition series represents the filling of core orbitals, <clears throat> and the number of valence electrons is mostly constant. So the number of valence electrons is usually those of um, the S and P block, uh, except for two exceptions. And the first of those is chromium, and the other one is copper. Okay, so chromium right here, copper is right here. If we zoom in on the periodic table, we can see that we've gone from 4s2 to 3d8. We go from 4s, oh, we lost, see, we lose one electron from our s orbital to put it into the d orbital. Same thing happens over here with chromium. We actually end up taking one electron out of uh, the d, the s orbital to put it into the d orbital. And this is because, clean this up a little, this is because the, um, the D subshells are particularly stable when they are half filled and completely filled. So remember, the D has five, has five uh, orbitals. Just copy this over here. So if we fill these up, you can see that one, two, three, four, five is one in each. And then completely filled also has a special stability. So the principal quantum number of the d orbitals being filled across each row in the transition series is equal to the row minus one. The row number minus one. Okay, we get another periodic table here. Okay, so when we get to 4, we're going to do 4s, and then we're going to do 3d. If we get to 5s, then we go to 4d. So the principal quantum number is 1 less than the row number. So for d orbital... Um, n is equal to 1 minus row number. So 
So let's write the electron configuration for phosphorus, right? We can start with neon to get the inner. These are always done in brackets. And it's just 3s2. Ooh, that's a terrible 2. 3s2, 3p3. Right? Easy enough, we can abbreviate. <clears throat> So we represent the inner configuration with the symbol for the previous noble gas in brackets, right? We've done this before a little bit. Outer electrons then are determined from the element's position within a particular block in the periodic table. The highest principal quantum number is equal to the row or the period number of the element in the, period, in the periodic table. And the principal quantum number end value of the outermost d electrons equals the row minus one. Just some rules to remember there. <clears throat> so now let's do tin, okay? Um, all right, so we got tin, tins here. So we can take a shortcut, right? We don't have to write all these out. I also want to um, just highlight, like, this is a useful tool. So I'm going to write it, 1s, 2s, 3s, 5s, 6s, success, 7s, 2p, 3p, 4p, and then we do um, 3d, 4d, 5d, right, and then we'll get uh, 4f, 5f, and then, oh, right, 60. I think there's a 60. It might not be a 60. Um, right, so then notice here, too, that when we actually go through this, right, we go 1s, 2s, just like we've been doing, and then we get 2p and 3s, 3p and 4s, but now notice here, We've gone from 4s, we go back down to 3d because we've gotten to the d block, right? So you do 4s and then 3d for this first row. So this helps you remember that without having to remember it necessarily. Okay. Having said that, let's continue on to what we were supposed to be doing and do the electron configuration for 10. So again, we can take our shortcut, our marker. Right, krypton. We're just doing an electron configuration. So krypton is in row four. So we're going to go to five. Right, five s. And we're going to put two in there. And now this is where we drop down into the D. I'm going to just zoom this in. Because we're going to go all the way across the D orbital. But we're going to start with four D. And there's 10 electrons that we can fit into the d orbital because it has five, right? Remember the hotel, five beds or five orbitals. So we're going to go, right? So we're going to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. We're going to fill those all the way across. So we're going to say that we have 10 electrons in our d orbital. And then we just move back to p and we move back to the principal, principal quantum number that we were at before. So we say 5p, where are we at? 2, 5p2, because it's the second element in that column. It's in the second column, 5p2, right? So this is for 10. The chemical properties of elements are largely determined by the number of valence electrons they contain. Element properties vary in periodic fashion because the number of valence electrons is periodic. The quantum mechanical model explains the reactivity of hydrogen and the inertness of helium and many other observations. Right, so atoms with eight valence electrons or two for helium, right, two is special, or uh, helium is special, they're predicted to be particularly low in energy and therefore stable. The noble gases are chemically stable and thus relatively inert or non-reactive. Elements with con electron configurations close to the noble gases 
are the most reactive because they can obtain noble gas electron configurations by losing or gaining a small number of electrons. All right, so our alkali metals. This is group 1A. Alkali metals are among the most reactive metals since their outer electron configuration, NS1, is one electron beyond a noble gas configuration. If they can react to lose the electron, they obtain a noble gas configuration. So this explains why group 1A metals tend to form 1 plus cations, right? So if we have lithium, lithium, its uh, valence electron configuration is 2s1. Or if we draw out an orbital diagram just for that, we just do, wow, that was ugly, 2s1, right? Or one electron in here. If we can lose this electron and lithium gains a positive charge, we can be the same electron configuration, in this case, as helium, which is much, much more stable. And so they're very likely to do that. Right? So this trend continues. In alkaline earth metals, our 2A group, all have electron configurations of N, right? N being our principal number, <clears throat> or principal shell, NS2. They are therefore two, four, two electrons beyond a noble gas configuration. So in their reactions, they tend to lose two electrons, forming two plus ions, and attaining a noble gas configuration. And that's why, when we've been using these throughout all of these problems that we've done so far, that is why they have a two plus. So up till now, we were using the law, right? We were using the scientific law that says beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, radon, radion, actually, rad. I can't remember what RA is, but all of these elements, we're using the law that says these will lose two, two electrons to form two plus ions. We've now learned the theory behind that. We've learned why they do that. <clears throat> now, moving back over to the right side of the periodic table, right, we've got our halogens to see them in context there. 7A, group 7A. <clears throat> they have... They just have to get one more electron, right? They're NS2, NP5. So they're one electron short of that noble gas configuration. In their reactions, halogens tend to gain one electron, forming negative or one minus ions and attaining a noble gas configuration, right? So if we can look at their electron configurations, right? Um, for, for fluorine, for example, we have 2S2, 2P5. If we go to... Sorry, is it neon that's the next one? Neon, right? Neon is 2s2, 2p6, right? So to go from here to here, that's a difference of one electron. If we gain one electron, we now have one more valence shell electron than we do co or, uh, protons. Sorry, I had to think about this. We have one more electron than we have, you know, proton or we have one more electron, then we have protons. So we have a minus one charge, a one minus charge. All right, so these are our elements that form predictable ions. And this is why these elements form these predictable ions, right? Nitrogen, or even oxygen, right? Oxygen, if fluorine is one away, oxygen is two away. And nitrogen is three electrons away. Aluminum, gallium, and indium are sort of in a similar boat, but they want to go the other way. So they just are three electrons away. But they're going to lose those three electrons. And these guys will gain three or two electrons. So let's look at periodic trends now, okay? So we know now moving left to right, top to bottom in the periodic table. We're gaining electrons, getting more and more electrons. And that's what causes a lot of the chemical properties that we see for these electrons. What it also determines and tells us is, uh, well, it also tells us more about, about these electrons and, it shows, and we can see periodic trends that line up with this property, right? So atomic size is one of those. Distance between the outermost electrons and the nucleus is the atomic size. So as we move across a period from left to right, the atomic size decreases. The size of an orbital depends on the principal quantum number. 
And this isn't going to change a, uh, across a period, right? So going from left to right. The size of the orbitals don't change. Across a period, the number of protons in the nucleus is increasing, which increases the pull on the electrons from the nucleus, causing the atomic size to decrease. Okay, so we're adding more positive charge to the nucleus. That attracts the electrons from the outside more strongly and gives us a change in size. Moving down a column in the periodic table, we, we have the opposite trend. The atomic size increases. So as we move down a column, the highest principal quantum number, n, increases. Since the size of an or orbital increases with the increasing principal quantum number, right, we learned that right when we were talking about orbitals. The electrons that occupy the outermost orbital are farther away from the nucleus as you move down a column, right? Gives us bigger uh, and bigger atoms. So there's a little, you know, a little cartoon diagram, right? So we can see that fluorine, uh, neon, and helium is the smallest. Maybe hydrogen's smaller. Hydrogen and helium are kind of weird, though, that because they only have that single shell. Right, but as we go from neon down to radon, we can see that the size of those is increasing. Right, moving from here, oops, here to here. And then we're also increasing as we go from right to left. So let's look at a couple examples and see if we can't determine which one's gonna be larger or smaller in each pair. Uh, so we'll start with lead. Lead is PB. Lead and polonium, right? So we're looking at this one and this one. As we move left to right, the size gets smaller, right? Because we're adding more electrons and that shrinks the size. Or, sorry, we're adding more protons, which causes it to shrink because we have more positive charge. Opposites attract. So which one is larger? Lead is gonna be larger. Rubidium or sodium? So you now have rubidium, sodium. Again, as we move down the periodic table, we're increasing our principal quantum number, right? N is going from one to two to three. And for every increase in principal quantum number, we increase the sizes of our orbitals. So rubidium is gonna be bigger than sodium. For tin and bismuth, Tin or bismuth. Now we're getting a little more tricky, right? Because we have tin, we have bismuth. So we're moving right and we're going down. So left to right means we're getting smaller, but top to bottom means we're getting bigger. The change in size is going to be bigger for the increasing orbital size. This direction is going to be more significant than this direction. So bismuth is bigger because it's in a lower row. All of its orbitals are larger. For fluorine and selenium, again, right? So you could even go back to this table, right? Tin, bismuth, gonna be roughly the same size. In fact, you might even be able to say they are the same size because we've got two counteracting, uh, two counteracting properties there. I'm actually going to take this back. I think these are going to be the same size. Selenium, though, we're moving down two, and we're moving to the left. So that's those stack on top of each other, right? So going down makes it bigger. Also, going to the left makes it bigger. So selenium is very much bigger than fluorine. Okay, so periodic trends. As we move right, we go smaller. As we go up, we go smaller. I don't like talking about these trends where one is making things smaller and the other one's making things bigger. Put them both into the same terms, right? If it's easier to remember that going uh, left is bigger and down is bigger, then use that to remember it. <clears throat> we also have this uh, property called ionization energy. The ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from the atom in the gaseous state. So the ionization of 
ionization energy of sodium, right, is, can work out like an equation like this. We add enough energy and that electron will leave. So this is another periodic trend. Ionization energy increases as you move to the right across a period. So removing an electron from a group one element gives it a noble gas configuration. That's very easy. But removing an electron from a group seven element does not give a noble gas configuration. And in fact, we're moving away from that configuration. It's a lot harder. So the higher the ionization energy, the harder it is to remove an electron. It's the energy required, right? You can kind of think of it like, um, oh, I don't know, if you're trying to break something, right? You're trying to break that electron away. The more energy it takes to break, the harder it is to break. Mochi agrees. Ionization energy decreases, though, as you move down a column in the periodic table. Right? So going from left to right, more energy. Going from top to bottom, decreases energy. But ionization energy and atomic size are inversely related. Right? So as we move down a column, the outermost electrons are farther from the nucleus and are thus easier to remove. Okay, so let's see. Let's look at this, right? And ionization energy decreases as you go down, increases as you go to the right. Or as I would like to remember it, right? So you can kind of remember it like this, like francium is going to have the lowest ionization energy. Right? And so moving from any other element, that's at the very bottom left, moving from any other element, like from nickel or from vanadium, we have to move down and we have to move to the left to get to francium. So the closer we get to francium, the lower the ionization energy. And then the opposite is true of fluorine. The noble gases are a little bit different. Um, they don't have, or they already have, right, configurations that are stable. So they have high ionization energies as well. But then remember, as you're trying to get to the top right of the periodic table, your ionization is going to increase. Right, so going up and to the right, increase. Down and to the left, decrease. And the opposite is true for uh, atomic size. So let's compare these ionization energies again. Right? So if we look at two elements, magnesium and strontium, we're moving down, okay? So as we move down, they get bigger, but as they get bigger, those electrons are farther away from the nucleus and they're easier to remove. So strontium is gonna be easier to ionize. Indium or tellurium. So indium, and then we need to look at tellurium, which is Te, and I have to find it first. Oh, here it is, tellurium. Okay, so we're moving to the right across the periodic table. You can think about this too. Whichever one sort of helps you out the most, as we move to the right, our atomic size is getting smaller. So as electrons get closer to the nucleus, it takes more energy. So our ionization energy then will be higher for tellurium than it is for indium, right? Right up and to the right is an increase. So tellurium is moving to the right, that's harder. So carbon and phosphorus. So this is one, again, we're moving to the right, but then we're moving down. So these are gonna be the same, right? So we got counteracting, counteracting properties here. They're also gonna be the same size. Then for fluorine and sulfur, All right, so we're moving down, which is going to make it bigger, but we're also moving to the left. So down and to the left is a decrease in ionization energy. So this is, again, where you can look at it like it's to the right and up that increases the ionization energy, and together those make a diagonal. So we're moving in a diagonal away from fluorine. We're moving down and to the left. So sulfur is going to have a lower ionization energy than fluorine. So fluorine has the higher ionization energy. Periodic trends, 
in metallic characters. So metals tend to lose electrons in their chemical reactions, while nonmetals tend to gain electrons. So as you move across a period, ionization energy increases, which means that electrons are less likely to be lost in chemical reactions. So this metallic character then can be explained by this trend in ionization energy. So as you move to the right across the periodic table, or sorry, metallic character decreases as you move to the right and increases as you move down a column in the periodic table. So metallic character follows the same trend as atomic size. Okay, so metallic character. And this makes sense, right? Again, look at this line. Let's do it in red, right? Look at this line. What is this line? This line is the division between the metals and the metalloids. And if we look, right, it's a diagonal. So moving up and to the right is less metallic. Right? Up, up, and to the right, less metallic. Moving down and to the left, however, more metallic. Okay, so we're just going to look here. We have another example? Yeah. So one more example. So we have, um, let's do this real quick too, right? Because we have, we have now atomic size. And we have um, metallic character. So atomic size and metallic, metallic character uh, decrease as we go to the right and up. And then the opposite of that is ionization. Ionization energy. So with the ionization energy, uh, we're increasing as we move to the right and up. Right? And so then the opposite if you move in the opposite direction, the opposite is true, right? And you can see then that these are opposite trends. Okay, so let's compare some metallic character. Tin and tellurium, moving to the right. So if we're moving to the right, again, look, look where our nonmetals are, right? These are our nonmetals. As we get closer to those, we're going to be less metallic. So tin is going to be more metallic. Silicon and tin. We're moving from silicon down to tin. Again, moving away from those nonmetals. Tin is more metallic. Bromine or tellurium. So you have bromine now, tellurium. If you're moving from something like carbon to phosphorus to selenium to iodine, those are going to all have roughly the same metallic character because we're moving across that trend, right? We're moving to the right, but we're also moving down. So from bromine to tellurium, though, when we're moving in that direction, we're doubling up on the effect. So tellurium is more metallic than bromine. Then for selenium or iodine, let's so see iodine, selenium, this is what I was just talking about. We're moving across our trend, right? So the trend towards the top right is less metallic. You can see how this is a line perpendicular to that trend. So these are going to be the same. I'll leave that there. Okay, so that is it for this chapter. Good luck on... Well, I hope you did well on the test. Um, I guess I'll check it out. And I will correct any mistakes as they pop up or as I see them. Um, Yep, that is it. I will see you live in person on Tuesday, Tuesday at 10 a.m. on the 8th. All right, and then we'll dig into the next chapter.